But right now, I want to welcome to the program Mr. Mike Karn uh, from the Federal Flight Deck Officers Association and the Coalition of Airline Pilots Associations. Mike, good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. How are you doing? I am great. Glad you could come on the uh, program tonight uh, to talk about what is going on with the budget for the Federal Flight Deck Officer Program, which, uh, you know, again, $25 million, uh, nothing to shake a stick at. Uh, but in terms of, you know, federal programs, this is not one of the pricier ones uh, that tax dollars are, are being used for. And yet the uh, the program itself, the budget is being cut in half in uh, President Obama's proposed 2013 budget from twenty five million dollars a year down to twelve million dollars a year. So first question, Mike, what would that cut mean for the federal fly deck officer program? Well, what we're looking at right now, Cam, and, and just historically, the budget has always been at about $22 million. That's from 2002 when you had just a handful to thousands of now federal flight deck officers that are out there. What you're looking at happening is, happening is no more new applicants. Your average pilot that participates in this program spends about $10,000 of their own money to volunteer for this program. So hundreds of millions of dollars over the, over the course of the life of this program have been spent by the federal flight tech officers themselves. So the federal government will be mm-hmm. denied that. The second thing is there's, there's quite a few people that are already lined up to participate in this and willing to spend that money that now the federal government will be saying no thank you to. In addition to that, facilities that are used to requalify as it's required in the program, uh, as a federal flight tech officer, there is a requirement for those folks to requalify with their pistols. Those facilities would probably be scaled back. The locations for initial training and the three to five year redeputization process that they go through would be scaled back. So you're t- you're looking at the, at the federal government saying, no, we don't really want you to spend ten thousand of your ten thousand dollars of your own money to come out and protect the flying public. We want you to just keep that. We don't really need you anymore. That's what that's what it's coming down to. You know, that is just so amazing to me, Mike, that uh, here we have this program where, you know, people are, as you say, they're spending their own money to do this. They're taking time away from their jobs and they're, uh, you know, they're they're getting they're not like they're getting paid to go out uh, and go through the training. Uh, And and yet this is uh, one of the programs that needs to be slashed in a in a budget, by the way, that. Uh, you know, it puts a, more than a trillion dollars in deficit spending on the table. H- has the president or anybody in the administration talked about why they believe this program's fund should be cut? Well, one of the things that they said in their reasoning is, is that they believe that there have been additional layers of security and that this was initially set up as the last line of defense. But now they claim they scream 100, screen 100 percent of the passengers. They screen their carry-on items. They have reinforced locking doors. This is all in the budget. So I'm not telling you anything that's secret. This mm-hmm. is exactly what's in the budget. Here's the problem, though, Cam. I deal with security at different airlines. Every single week we have reports of weapons, some knife we- knife-edge weapons getting on board an aircraft. We have 100% screening, but we're not infallible. We're going to let things get through. This is why there need to be multiple layers of security. We're more vigilant than we were before 9-11, but we're not infallible. We always have to assume a failure rate. Something will get through. Something could happen. And that's one of the reasons that they're saying, hey, we don't need this anymore. Well, then why would you go back and start taking away layers of defense? It just doesn't make sense. Well, absolutely right. Um, So, you know, looking forward, let's say that this uh, actually goes through. um, What what, would there be? Would there continue to be a federal flight deck officer program or eventually is this uh, on its way out? Are we going to see the demise of the armed pilots? Well, first off, this was passed as law in 2002. So it's the will of Congress that this program continue. If the administration wants to shut it down, they're going to have to have a discussion with the legislators over that. Uh, Two, our country would be missing out on the most cost-effective counterterrorism element out there. The cost for a single, this is what it costs the federal government to put an FFD on a flight, Mm -hmm. $15, approximately $15. To put a federal agent on a flight is over $3,000. So, Cam, you can take two federal agents and put them in the front of first class of an aircraft and then fill up all of business and all of coach with FFDOs for the same price. So that means you would be missing out on putting 450 people out in the system 
to help protect this flying country, this, this country and this industry. It doesn't make sense. It would drastically cut us back. It would remove the facilities. It would make it harder for volunteers to participate in the program, mm -hmm. to get to their requalification sites. It would discourage people from participating in the program. And if you remember, a couple years ago, we had the comments that, oh, we thought they were going to try and cut the program uh, completely out. They said, oh, no, no, we support the program. Well, you support the program not just with words but with dollars. And when you consider the budget, and we're talking about a program right now that has $25 million in 2012, and now they only want to give it $12 million, that's a drop in the bucket considering the amount of safety and protection to prevent an aircraft from becoming another weapon of mass destruction. That's, well, that's pennies. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, look, I, I'm all in favor of cost effective government. Uh, I'm not proposing or uh, in favor of getting rid of the federal air marshals program by any means. But, no, you know, no, again, they're, they're, they have a specific duty. The air marshals, and you know, I, I do need to say this the air marshals that we see as pilots out there on the line are professional, are, are, are excellent people. And we're very happy to have them on our aircraft. Mm -hmm. What? But the thing that we, we have a problem with as pilots is that this program seems not to be wanted by DHS. So the question is, why don't we go to a different agency? Maybe it's Department of Justice, somebody else, no. where the program can literally be taken care of the way it should be. Has this is this Mike? Is this a uh, a problem that you've seen within specifically the Obama administration, or has this? It seems to me like there's always been sort of a, a rocky relationship between DHS and the FFDOs. I don't, there, say, there I don't want to say rocky necessarily, but, uh, I mean, it does the relationship, uh, you know, it, I, I guess describe the relationship that the FFDOs have had with DHS over the years. Well, it took a lot just to get this program out, Cam. And remember, for years, decades, pilots already carried weapons. The regulation was out there and quietly disappeared about two years before um, – 9-11. Mm -hmm. We have a, a sidearm on display in, in uh, our association hall that was carried by a gentleman for years. And so after 9-11, it was a big struggle for us to get the law passed. A lot of people didn't want to see it happen, and they begrudgingly allowed it to occur. The original report, the original design of this came from Department of Justice for Flying Armed. We ended up having this program. Uh, the pilots ended up having this in the hands of TSA. I am not sure I've heard them say they support it, but when I see things like this, it makes me doubt it. And as you look through as a volunteer force, right now this group, this Federal Flight Tech Officer Group, CAM, represents about the third largest group of federal law enforcement officers in the nation, and they're volunteers. Wow. And again, you know, I, I, I've got to guess, Mike, um, probably less than 5% of America uh, is aware of that. You know, that's the, that's the thing about this program. $25 million price tag, as you say, uh, the third largest law enforcement agency in America, costs 15 bucks uh, to uh, uh, put an armed pilot uh, on a flight. Why don't more people know about this program? It's, it's the quiet professional, and this is the way you want it. You don't want them heard. You don't want them seen. They should just be known that they're there as the last line of defense. You know, on 9-11... On there's discussion that on one of the flights, and we believe it was 93, that there was an officer that was required to stow his weapon in the belly of the aircraft on that flight. Had that weapon been in the cabin of the aircraft, we might be having a different conversation about that flight, Cam. Really? I, that is, uh, I had never heard that before. There's stuff out there. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mike, I mean, what, what, what is the uh, Federal Flight Deck Officers Association? What's the Coalition of Airline Pilots Associations? Uh, what, what are they doing to, uh, uh, to try to combat this uh, budgetary move by the Obama administration? What we're doing, sir, is we're going to some of our friends in the House and the Senate, and we're having these conversations. In fact, we started these several months ago because the law itself says it was to be done at no cost to the pilot or to the company. And they've been very good about making sure that the company doesn't pay for anything. But the pilots, like I said, after they take time off and trips and travel, and they, what they basically do is say, I'm not going to fly this trip. I won't be paid for it, company, so I can go to this training. The guys are spending about ten grand of their own money. And we've already been to Capitol Hill to point out over the years, we're talking over $400 million has been put into the program by the pilots. Mm-hmm. 
and only $22 million each year by the federal government. And we've been asking them, could we move up the move up the budget a little bit so that more and more of the people that want to volunteer for this can participate in this? And we've already started that discussion on the Hill. That's why this is such a surprise. The Federal Flight Deck Officer Association was just going up on the Hill just uh, and talking with folks up there about, could we at least get some money to get the pilots that are volunteering right now that have been denied the process going through the process because there's no money? Can we at least get the money to get the people that want to right now participate? And we were already looking at that. That's why this is such a surprise. Is there a, uh, a big demand? Uh, I mean, are, are there a lot of individuals right now who would like to become federal flight deck officers? Hundreds. Hundreds right now. There are hundreds that are, that are presently in the process wanting to participate. That means they've started up, they've, they've, they've submitted their application to TSA, and TSA does a very thorough job of screening these applicants. Mm-hmm. Um, they're already in the lineup, and they're being told, no, there are no class dates because there's no money. Wow. This is, so it, it, it doesn't make sense because right. if one of the reasons that they say that they want to they want to go for something that is uh, lowest cost, mm-hmm. you already have that with this program. Right, right. You already have the last doorstop of preventing uh, an aircraft from being used as a weapon of mass destruction. It's right there. So the arguments, when I read the arguments, I'm reading something that was written by somebody who was sitting behind a desk, not somebody who's living it, not <sighs> somebody who's out on the line, not somebody who's flying it. And not somebody who knows what we're still dealing with. We're not 100% on anything, Cam. We, we might say we screen 100%, but do we catch 100%? Right. We're more vigilant. We're not infallible. Well, listen, I, I, I think that's, uh, I think, Mike, you're, you're completely spot on there. Um, and that's why this is just so, it, it is, it's puzzling. So if it's not the reasons that you're hearing, uh, then what do you think the real reason is? Well, I or or is it the disconnect between the bureaucracy and, and and the people who are actually doing this every day as FFDOs? I think that part of it is a disconnect with the bureaucracy, and I also think that there are some folks out there that just don't want this program around. For some reason, there's a disconnect between the amount of trust that they give us as pilots to fly the people eighty percent of the speed of the sound across the United States and the trust that they would give a pilot who is an FFDO to protect them with a firearm. There's a disconnect between there. Why would you say to a pilot, hey, I can trust you to take me to uh, stormy Chicago tonight, but if you put a gun in your hand, there's something wrong. That just doesn't make sense. Right. This is a, this is a very regulated, rules-orientated group that lives within a box, that understands and lives by FAA regulations. Now you're just simply applying a defense or a counterterrorism element in it by introducing a firearm to protect the aircraft. These are well-regulated people. There are some people that just have a bent against that camp. I don't know why. Uh, I got to tell you, I mean, you, you can't help but wonder, Mike, if it is just a, 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 a generally an anti-gun attitude, if it is, uh, you know, the... It, because to, to me, that's it, there's got to be something to this. I, I mean, and given what the FFDOs have to do already to transport their firearms, I know that there was a discussion. Uh, I saw a news story about this a couple of months ago about actually letting the pilots uh, have their firearms in their holster uh, rather than in a locked briefcase, which, again, seems a pretty good idea to me. Uh, but there were all kinds of the usual suspects objecting to this idea. Well, one of the big stops to that, Cam, is in the law itself, there's a section in there, G, that requires, and that's the public law, so I'm not talking about anything that's secret here. Right. But that says specifically that the firearm cannot leave the cockpit even if the pilot leaves for physiological reasons. That was put in there originally by a a person who really didn't support this program to make this program as hard as possible. That is one of the hurdles that needs to be overcome and changed in the law. So when you look at that, there is a roadblock that is in the law that needs to be changed. And the Federal Flight Deck Officer Association is working on that right now. And we are working in conjunction with our friends at the National Association of Police Organizations as well. All right. Well, listen, Mike, I really appreciate you coming on the program. I think this is just it's a fascinating issue to me. Uh, And like I said, if you fly, if you know somebody who does fly, this is an issue that should be important to you as well. Uh, I hope that you'll continue to come on the program and keep us updated as to the uh, status of the budget uh, for the Federal Flight Officer Program this year, will you? 
We absolutely will, sir, and I want to thank uh, all of our friends out there at the National Rifle Association and all of its members that have been a good support to us. Thank you to all you folks. Absolutely. Thank you to you, Cam. Hey, thank you, Mike. Have a good evening, sir. You too, sir. Take care. Mike Karn uh, with us from the Federal Flight Deck Officers Association and the Coalition of Airline Pilots Associations.